Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense, common knowledge, or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do, but only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Quick note before we begin, the Finding Genius Foundation, as part of the Finding Genius Podcast, has recently completed a book about understanding viruses. So the creation of this book was to interview a 100 virologists, ask them a lot of deep, difficult questions, take the most difficult questions, and then re-interview the top 25 or so and ask them the hardest questions I could think of. And we compiled that all into a book. So you'll see question and four or five experts' answers. Question, four or five experts' answers. There's about 30 questions in the book. I think it's a great read for the layperson and for the researcher. It talks about a lot of speculation in the world of viruses, such as are they alive or not? And why is it important? Uh, why do viruses go latent or hidden or uneffective or sit in a person or an animal or another creature for weeks, months, years, and then suddenly become virulent and affect that person? Uh, so there's a lot of really provocative questions in the book. It's now on Amazon. So if you go to Amazon and type in Finding Genius, you'll see the book on viruses. It's also on Kindle. The Audible version is in production and should be ready in approximately a month. But if you want to go and order it now, uh, you can do so, again, by going to Amazon or Kindle or go, go to FindingGeniusFoundation.org and go to Publications. There's an opportunity as well to get the transcripts of all the interviews and to hear the original interviews themselves. If we had put them all together, the book would be about a 1,000 pages, but we condensed them down to make it juicy and concise and tight and very interesting. So I hope you'll check out the book. Uh, we're now working on one about cancer, but this is going to be our goal is uh, three times a year to come out with these masterclass books that I think will inspire new scientific research, and I hope you'll check it out. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have Lucas Driscoll. Uh, he's an assistant professor at the Yale School of Medicine. We're going to talk about neurology and Alzheimer's disease, and uh, he's a clinical neuropsychologist. So... Again, let's talk about uh, Alzheimer's and clinically uh, what you encounter. So, Lucas, thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me, Rich. I appreciate it. Yeah, well, why do you work with, uh, with Alzheimer's in the first place? Yeah, so as a clinical neuropsychologist, uh, my role in particular with individuals with Alzheimer's disease is to help kind of figure out how they're doing and their cognitive abilities. Um, Alzheimer's disease can be difficult to diagnose in a lot of cases just for kind of general practitioners. Uh, there's a lot of different disease processes and psychological factors that can cause someone to have memory impairment or changes to their thinking skills. And as we know, also sometimes things just change as you get older. You have a little more difficulty with certain abilities. So my role as a neuropsychologist is to help determine whether someone's having cognitive difficulties, and in particular, if those cognitive difficulties are consistent with an Alzheimer's disease process. Okay. So clinically, um, at what stage do you see people early on or later on, or do you see them at all stages? Yeah, that's a good question. Really at all stages. Um, I see sometimes very early on in the beginning, um, and then sometimes very late as well, and really kind of depends on the referral question. Um, in the beginning, it tends to be more of, am I having cognitive difficulties? Do I have Alzheimer's disease? Things like that. Whereas in the later stages, focus may be more on what are my capabilities? What are what are my strengths and weaknesses? Sometimes the question is, does this person still have capacity to be making decisions for themselves? Or does the family members need more support or can they still care for this person by themselves? Um, so really depending on the stage, the, the question and the answers are very different. Well, what do you notice about people at various stages of uh, cognitive decline? What's different about them or what stands out? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, early in the stages, uh, there's primarily just issues with uh, forgetfulness, uh, misplacing items, maybe some word finding difficulties, or they're prone to forget uh, appointments or conversations. They might start repeating themselves. And as the disease progresses and it starts to impact other cognitive abilities, um, ultimately it starts to impact the person's functioning, where they may start having more difficulty with driving uh, difficulty with managing their medications, therefore getting to pay bills, 
um, and family has to intervene a little bit. And this is often when the family becomes a lot more concerned. Um, and ultimately, it leads to just total cognitive failure and uh, full dependence upon their loved ones. Do the people know that they're in various stages of the decline or at what point do people become aware of it? Yeah, so it's difficult um, because with Alzheimer's disease, it's such a, every patient's a little different. Um, and there may be similarities in a lot of them, but some people have very good insight and they're, they're very aware of the challenges and the changes that they're having and experiencing. Whereas other people, they really have almost no insight at all. Uh, they think they are perfectly fine uh, even though they can't tell you what you asked them five minutes ago. Um, and, and that in particular can be really frustrating for caregivers, as you can imagine, because the, the individual is not able to recognize the difficulties they have. Well, what happens when you tell someone, you know, hey, you repeated that four times, or, you know, how come you keep losing your keys every day, et cetera? Does the, does the person get defensive, or what do they say when they're, they're faced with it? Yeah, so that's a good question, because um, it appears as if they may be getting defensive, Whereas in actuality, due to the changes that are happening in the brain, the person really just is not able to recognize that they're having these difficulties, their ability to self-reflect upon their skill set and uh, changes. And then also just when someone has memory difficulties, inherently, they're not always going to remember the difficulties they're having. So it's kind of twofold there. Uh, but I, we often recommend that caregivers or family members don't remind that patient that you don't say, well, you already asked me that, or you've already, you've asked me that five times. We usually tell them not to say that just because, I mean, it doesn't feel good for the patient and it may end up making them feel sad or frustrated. It can cause arguments. So instead we often just recommend kind of just roll with it and often just redirect is the easiest way to avoid confrontation. Well, I mean, is it helpful? I mean, it, I guess there's not really much remedy. You know, there's no really drugs that uh, can help. But is it helpful for someone to know that they're having the problem? Or does it just cause them to panic? And does it ruin their life for them to know? Like, what's the best thing? Yeah, so that's a good question, too. Um, I, I think that every person deserves to know what is going on. So I think at some point, uh, they deserve to be told. But I don't think it's necessary to continuously tell a patient that is forgetful uh, that they have Alzheimer's disease or remind them that they have Alzheimer's disease just because it may upset them. Uh, it may make them sad, may make them angry, it may make them agitated, and they may just forget later on. So it may not really be worth it to do so. Yeah, I mean, I would think uh, most people are afraid of getting Alzheimer's. You know, I am. I don't know if you are, but uh, I would think yeah. it would be pretty terrifying, I guess. You know? And to be honest, you know, that's something that really does surprise me um, almost every day. I, so I evaluate four patients a week. And a lot of my patients, uh, the question is, does this person have Alzheimer's disease? Yes or no. Or do they have dementia? Yes or no. And so at least three to four people a week, I'm often giving bad news to. And it is incredibly surprising to see how resilient people are. Because you think people would just completely fall apart um, or, you know, you see on the movies when people get these things, they just completely break down. But often, you know, people get sad uh, appropriately, but people are just so resilient. A lot of people shift their focus on, okay, well, you know, what can I still do? What am I still good at? Okay, well, how many years do you think I have left? And the, the conversation moves to more so of how do we prioritize your health and how do we prioritize your quality of life moving forward? And how do we make sure that you live a fulfilled life? And what are things that are important to you that you want to still try to accomplish? Well, what would those things be with, uh, you know, limited capacity? Yeah. So it really depends on where the person is, but really it's, it's helping kind of figure out what brings them fulfillment. Uh, for some people, it's just being outside. They just like seeing nature, um, which really anyone can do. Sometimes it's just, they enjoy reading, they enjoy coloring. Uh, they want to travel a little bit, um, really whatever it is for that person. Is it good for them to do therapy every week with you, for instance, or like, or to have a therapist in general? Like, what's, uh, what's the recommendation there? Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, 
We need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now back to the show. So that's a good question as well. So I, I, I'm a so as a neuropsychologist, some do uh, therapy. I only do assessment, but with some of my patients, especially early on um, when they, because I, I think what's confusing is that with Alzheimer's disease, someone can technically have it and they can be cognitively perfectly fine. It's it's a very slow and insidious disease process, right? So sometimes I maybe see someone that they're having very mild issues and they, they really don't meet criteria for dementia. They instead have something that we call mild cognitive impairment where they are having some cognitive difficulties, but generally they're doing pretty well in their day-to-day life. And for those individuals, they're often a good fit for psychotherapy. And if I think that they uh, need psychotherapy, I, I certainly recommend it. Um, whenever someone's in that later stage, when they already meet criteria for dementia, they're having significant cognitive impairment. Usually traditional psychotherapy is not uh, the most helpful, but in particular, it can be helpful for the caregivers, not only just for their own support, but also uh, working on different strategies that they can use to, with their individual that has Alzheimer's, to keep them more relaxed or to change the environment so they don't get stressed, to improve their sleep cycles, things like that. Okay. So the therapy is, I mean, is the therapy more for their mind or is it more habits? You know, now that they're in this condition, it would help if they're, let's say, more regimented in their schedule or like what kinds of things can help people live, you know, as their impairment grows? Yeah. So we, we really focus on a couple of things. One, we focus on uh, exercise which is incredibly important. And kind of like you just brought up, having routine and schedule is also very important. Um, I think all of us are kind of creatures of habit. And in particular, when someone has a neurodegenerative disease like Alzheimer's disease, they really thrive in structure and in schedules. And they may be prone to be uh, less driven because they're a little apathetic because of the disease process. So a loved one, like a caregiver, implementing a schedule that they follow every day can be really helpful for that person to thrive. And often it it should include exercise, which has been shown to be very helpful for Alzheimer's disease, you know, good diet, uh, engaging in activities that are cognitively stimulating. Uh, And really that can be a little bit of anything, uh, things that in particular, something that they enjoy. And I often get a question of, you know, should, should my loved one do crossword puzzles? And well, do they like crossword puzzles? Because if they, if they hate doing crossword puzzles, then no, they should not do it. It's got to be a little creative about, you know, what they enjoy doing that is cognitively stimulating. For example, sometimes I'll see someone who is a retired English teacher. Okay, well, what did you enjoy? Who were some of the authors that you really enjoyed? Well, can you go back and look at some of their work and read about that or whatever it is? So okay. focusing on what they enjoy. If, if people engage themselves mentally, you know, crossword puzzles, I don't know what else they would do. You know, again, uh, writing, reading, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Does that seem to slow or dampen the decline or does it have no effect? Yeah, so it's hard to give kind of a blanket statement. But what we do know is when people become kind of apathetic and they lose the drive and they just kind of sit on the couch all day long, we know that those individuals tend to have more of a steep decline. Whereas individuals that remain active, both physically, mentally, socially, they tend to have a slower decline and they maintain independence for longer. Okay. So it does help slow things. Interesting. Yeah. I I don't know. Are there other, like, so you do the assessments, but does that leave you feeling satisfied? I mean, so you assess someone, but don't you, I mean, I would think you'd have the drive to help them. Of course you do. But why do you stop at the assessment part? Why don't you go further and do you wish to? Unfortunately, I only have so much time in the week. I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to psychoanalyze you, I guess. I'm, I'm yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's a good question. And there, there are certainly neuropsychologists out there that do the intervention. But If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. 
for me, I specialize in the assessment. And for me, you know, there's however many people, you know, there's over 6 million people in just the U.S. alone that have Alzheimer's disease. And it's going to continue to grow and grow. It's doubling by 2050. And there are certainly not enough neuropsychologists out there. For example, right now, I have a, I have a solid six month wait list just to get wow. patients in. And even with that, and, and it's, I'm not unique. There's neuropsychologists all across the U S who all have, you know, wait lists months long. And even with that over 50, close to 75% of patients with mild cognitive impairment or dementia, some kind of neurodegenerative disease, they never receive a comprehensive workup. They don't see a neuropsychologist or they don't see even a neurologist it's just their general practitioner who manages it all. And general practitioners, they're doing the best that they can, but they don't necessarily have the specialty education and training to diagnose neurodegenerative diseases uh, because certain ones can present similarly. So my role is really to help in the initial stage to clarify, is this a neurodegenerative disease? And if so, what is it? Is it Alzheimer's disease? Is it Lewy bodies? Um, is it primarily a vaccine? vascular process. So that's kind of the role that I serve is to help provide clarity. Okay. How do you see your role evolving or you're busy, you're just in the middle of it, you're enjoying what you do, you know, you're just going to continue on from here or, I mean, what do you see as is needed in the Alzheimer's field? It sounds like more neuropsychologists like you diagnose people. So at least they know more what's going on, but I mean, what else do you see that's needed in the field? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I think that more... When just thinking about the research in general of Alzheimer's disease, there is a big push right now for more of a focus on multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary research. And I think that's really what's going to push things forward because Alzheimer's disease is a multifaceted disease process. It impacts the brain, but it also impacts their behavior. It impacts their psychological status. It impacts the family unit. Uh, it really disrupts a lot of things. So a lot of these clinical trials that are going on for Alzheimer's disease need to represent that and have different providers from different specialties who can target all those changes. Um, so I see that's really where the field's going for Alzheimer's disease. One focus in particular has been on, of course, medications that can modify the disease process. And still there is no successful uh, disease modifying medications for Alzheimer's disease. And a lot of times, you know, they try these medications and they seem promising and then they show that they don't really work. And a lot of times they, they kind of throw out the idea, well, maybe we're just still not catching it early enough. So the focus is shifting to these very longitudinal studies where ideally we can start treating someone before they have any clinical symptoms at all. The disease process is there, but there's absolutely no symptoms. Maybe that's when we need to treat it. I don't really know what the answer is, but that's yeah. kind of where it's at. I got you. Well, I'm not sure what to ask you in this regard. So what do you see as the future of Alzheimer's? Is it going to be more on the drug side or do you think there's a, is there going to be a CBT for Alzheimer's essentially? Is there such a thing? Could such a thing be made? Would it be helpful in your opinion? Yeah. So you know, like CBT is in cognitive behavioral therapy. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I think that where part of the field is going is that similar to something like, you know, HIV, you know, HIV used to kill people and it still does, but now it's really a disease that people can live with. And I think that's ideally where the Alzheimer's disease uh, field is going to go, where it is something that it can be treated and managed. And I think at that point, when we get to the point where it can be managed, and either uh, drastically slowed down or just stopped and kind of halted, then I think that CBT plays a significant role in helping the people cope with the persistent deficits that they'll have moving forward. Well, how do you feel about your own situation and your family and just, you know, people in general? Because, I mean, every day for you, you're dealing with people with impairment. So does that, does that affect you? Do you think if you forget anything, oh, my God, I hope it's not happening to me or... You know, what can people take from your experience that would help them? So this might be a little morbid, but I once had a supervisor who said, you know, something in your body is going to fail and kill you. And for some people, it's the brain. For other people, it's their liver. For other people, it's their lungs, whatever it is. So something is going to get us. And being around this all day long is concerning and is worrisome. And my parents are getting older. 
Um, but all we can really do is live in the now and focus on the now. And we can try to say as healthy as we can and engage in lifestyle factors that will help minimize our risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. But there's nothing necessarily that's a perfect uh, thing that we can do. Yeah, it makes sense. I was going to ask you, people that have Lewy body dementia versus Alzheimer's versus early onset versus familial versus other problems, what, are there any differences or is the decline in the loss of cognition manifesting the same way? Yeah, so there's a couple things there. If we're thinking specifically with uh, Alzheimer's disease, so early onset would be before the age of 65, uh, late onset after the age of 65. Uh, they typically present pretty similarly. There may be a little bit of differences. Early onset may have a little more of some kind of personality or behavioral changes with it. Typically, they're about the same. Lewy bodies is a, a different disease process, and it impacts different areas of the brain first. So whereas with Alzheimer's disease, often uh, one of the most noticeable first symptoms is memory difficulties. Whereas with Lewy bodies, it can cause more difficulty with what we call visual spatial skills. So kind of drawing complex designs, putting together colored blocks to match images. Um, people with difficulty with that may report, you know, I feel like I'm kind of bumping into things or I'm, I'm visually, I misplace things all around the house and it's just because they don't really notice it visually. Or maybe their loved ones become really concerned about their driving because they're just not noticing cars around them or they're stopping too close to other cars. And it can also cause issues with fluctuating attention where uh, sometimes they're locked in and they're sharp and other times they seem just to be completely in a different world or they're just way in their head. And they're not really paying attention. So two different processes that can cause two very different presentations initially. Do you notice any other differences? I mean, so different things, I guess, are going wrong. But again, like the clinical presentation to you, can you tell, oh, this person is not Alzheimer's, they're, they're Louis body or this person is this or that or the other, et cetera? Yeah. And then that's really kind of part of my job is because these individuals in the general public, they're just reporting kind of similar concerns. And with my neuropsycho uh, eval, with the neuropsychological evaluation, we can really help uh, kind of dig in there and test all their thinking skills to look for those cognitive strengths and weaknesses to see if we can see a profile that's consistent with Lewy bodies versus Alzheimer's disease. So yeah, we, we can definitely pick that up for most people. So what does that look like? Like, what do you notice that's different? Yeah, so with Alzheimer's disease in particular, the, one of the main issues that's impacted in the brain is an area called the mesial temporal lobes. And those are important for memory consolidation. So with Alzheimer's disease, there's this idea that information will come into the brain, it goes to the storage facility, but then the storage facility is just not really working well. So the information doesn't really properly get stored so that later on, when you ask them about the information, they don't really remember it um, because it never really stored. And then you may try to give them uh, recognition assistance uh, by giving them reminders or asking them questions about the information you want them to learn. And that doesn't really help because again, it never really stored. So that's why these individuals may forget conversations. But then when you say, well, you know, remember uh, Tony was there and those, those things don't really help. So that's one of the main issues that we noticed first off with Alzheimer's disease. And with Lewy bodies, again, we see those visual spatial difficulties on drawing task. We see some fluctuating attention issues. We also see some changes to this kind of large cognitive domain that we call executive functioning skills. So maybe their problem solving abilities aren't as good as they used to be. Um, they have a little bit of difficulty with multitasking. But then also with Lewy bodies, there are some interesting symptoms that can develop that are a little more unique to Lewy bodies. Of course, nothing is black and white. People with Alzheimer's disease can have these issues, but it's primarily people with Lewy bodies. And what I'm referring to is people with Lewy bodies often develop visual hallucinations. And in particular, they often happen at nighttime. And they're usually not scary, but they are, they can become very well formed where they'll see people, they'll see animals, see kids. And then uh, another thing they may develop is something called REM sleep behavior disorder, where while they are asleep, they'll start thrashing. They may be punching, kicking, talking, and that's very common in Lewy bodies as well. And it's definitely not as common in Alzheimer's disease. Um, if people can't form new memories, 
<clears throat> what happens to the existing base of memory and knowledge that they have? Does it does that fall off later? Does that become more deeply ingrained in their brain? Does it? I mean, what do you think that that existing bank does? Yeah. So in the earlier stages of Alzheimer's disease, a lot of those long term memories about their childhood, about their career, about their marriage, their children, things like that, those are typically good and locked in there. Um, it's just more so the new information that's coming in. It's hard to learn. And because the disease has been happening for a year, two years, whatever it is, it's hard for them to maybe remember stuff from a year ago or two years ago, because that's when the clinical symptoms have started. But as the disease, as the disease progresses and things get worse, then ultimately it does start to impact those long-term memories. And it is a lot more challenging to remember, you know, when you got married or, where you were born, those things. Are they frozen in time in a way? I, I just, I know, I just wonder what happens when you can't really learn new information. Again, with your existing base, how does your body accommodate life? How does it accommodate situations? Like, do you see them responding to common scenarios in strange or different ways or in maybe antiquated ways that don't make sense today? And, and I don't want to give the idea that it's, they truly cannot learn anything new. Uh, because still information, some information does get in there and get stored. It's just a lot more difficult for them. But no, but what tends know. to, yeah, what tends to get stored? Like what, what kind of memories, you probably have the experience to know, oh, they're not going to remember this. But this, they may remember. Like what are the triggers that, that break through that make it possible to form new memories? Yeah. So sometimes it's just implicit memory. So it's something that they are physically doing that they may or may not really think about it. So if you can get someone into kind of a routine of physically doing something that, you know, right when we wake up, we get out of bed and we go take our medications and just physically going through that motion and it's kind of the body just learns that that's a way of learning things. They go get their medications and they walk over to their calendar and see what's on the schedule. And every morning, whenever your partner wakes up, you have them walk to their medications and then walk to their schedule Sometimes the body can learn that this is what I need to do every day. So there can still be learning in that sense. And then about just other information, honestly, I, it's, it's just random. Some information gets in, some doesn't, and it's really not clear cut as to why. Well, yeah, that's right. You're just doing the assessment. Are you, you don't, do you see the people again or you just see them the first time? Yeah. So often I do see people uh, a year, two years, three years later, whenever it is sometime in the future, just because it's, it can be helpful for tracking change because it's not always a perfect slow decline for some people they have some issues but they you know they really implement a lot of changes so say for example i see someone and i evaluate them they're having some cognitive difficulties and i'm concerned that they may have alzheimer's disease but i notice that also they're very depressed and they have sleep apnea and they're not treating it. Um, their sleep is very disrupted and they are eating horribly, right? So I evaluate them and I'll say, you know, I'm concerned you're having these difficulties, but also there's all these other things I think are going to be really important to target. So I want you to target them and come back in a year. So during that year, you know, they get a sleep study. They, they get prescribed a CPAP machine that helps them sleep at night and uh, helps them breathe at night. They start eating healthier. They start exercising. They maybe start an antidepressant to help their mood. And maybe they go to therapy um, if appropriate. And then they come back in 12 months or you know 18 months and we reevaluate them and we see how they're doing. And some people are doing a little bit better or they're staying really kind of exactly the same and they haven't really declined. Um, so there are a lot of those lifestyle factors are really important targets. Have you seen people come out of it where they're dramatically better? next time you see them or has that never happened? I have, but then that tells me it was not Alzheimer's disease because sometimes we see people and they are having cognitive difficulties and it is a little concerning for a neurodegenerative process. But again, there's all these other things that could be causing those issues. And even just medication sometimes can cause cognitive difficulties. So we recommend they adjust all those, they come back and they're doing significantly better. Um, in particular, the, the CPAP one that I mentioned is a huge thing. I think people don't really realize how impactful and important sleep is on cognitive functioning. So once people improve their sleep quality, they perform much better on our evaluations. So for people listening, what kinds of events, you know, forgetfulness events in their life should make them concerned where they want to talk to someone like you and which ones are 
it's just normal. Yeah, so, so it kind of depends on the age because something that happens as we get older is our, you know, things change in our brain and it's very normal. What is pretty normal is people often develop slower processing speed or maybe their brain just doesn't move as fast as it used to. And then there can be some of that kind of normal forgetfulness of, you know, every once in a while, oh, wait, where did I put my phone or where are the car keys at or where are my sunglasses? That's normal. But I think red flags should start to come up a little bit whenever it is happening more frequently. If it's happening, you know, every other day you're losing things. And in particular, you're losing them and you can't find them, right? Another thing would be when it starts to impact your functioning. So if your forgetfulness means that you are now forgetting to pay bills and they're about to turn off your electricity, or it means that you're driving and you are just completely disoriented. You're saying, wait, how do I get home? Or I know I'm supposed to be going to the grocery store, but I don't remember where it is. And I'm kind of confused. And if that keeps happening, then that's when it's time to get help. So who, how do people come to you? Is it the spouse or a family member that brings them in? Or does the person come in on their own accord? A little bit of both. Um, often people talk with their primary doctor um, and they get referred to neurology and then the neurologist sees them. And then Neurologists will order a comprehensive workup, and that often includes blood work. It'll include like a brain MRI, and then it'll include neuropsych, a neuropsych eval. And people will often ask me, you know, why do I need a neuropsychological evaluation if I'm getting a brain MRI? And I think it's a good question because they, they both answer very different things. I like to think of it as you know, imagine you're you're going to buy a car, you're buying a used car and you're looking online and, you know, seeing all the photos of the car is really helpful, right? To look at all the photos, but it doesn't tell you how the car drives and vice versa. Imagine driving a car, you know, but you have no idea what it looks like. Really both are important. You need to see what the car looks like. And also you need to tra- test drive to make sure it's running well. Same thing. The brain MRI shows us how the brain's looking, but it doesn't necessarily tell us how the brain's working. So we need the neuropsych to figure that out. Well, what shows up on scans if someone has, I mean, can you correlate it if you look at a scan and say, oh, I think that's probably Lewy body, but that's Alzheimer's or that's something else. Or do you need to have all the pieces of the puzzle in place for you to make an evaluation? Yeah, I I think it really, in the early stages, no, I I don't think imaging is um, sufficient enough, unfortunately. In the later stages, sometimes, but really not really, the, the more data you have, the more confident you can be. And I have seen people that have had just significant atrophy in their brain and I evaluate them and they are doing perfectly fine and vice versa. Some people, they have very healthy looking brain and it doesn't look like any issues there at all, but then you test them and they're having significant difficulty. So, so imaging is not a nice one-to-one in regards to functioning. What kinds of things do you see in images, though? Like, what's interesting that shows up that gives indicators? For Alzheimer's disease in particular? Yeah, Alzheimer's or any of the other dementia-related conditions that you observe. Yeah, so Alzheimer's disease in particular, uh, now what some neurologists will order is they'll order 3D volumetric analysis on the brain MRI, which is a way for the computer to analyze kind of the volume of different brain areas. And what it can do is it can help give a percentage volume of the hippocampi, which are really important for memory. And in particular, the hippocampi play a large role in Alzheimer's disease because they're the the first area that tends to be impacted. So the imaging can show atrophy in the hippocampi or the mesial temporal lobes area. But again, it's not always a one-to-one. Okay. When you do your analysis, do you have people like do puzzles or is it just talking to you or, you know, what is the session like? Yeah. So we... Usually is a three to four hour evaluation. The first about 30 minutes or 45 minutes will just be me interviewing, asking them questions, getting to know them, getting to know their family, asking the family member questions. It's always good to have collateral information. And then we'll switch gears and we'll do the testing itself. And the testing is a wide variety of things. We'll ask them to draw complex designs. We'll try to get them to learn Uh, short stories or uh, visual designs or a word list. We'll have them complete some task very quickly in a timed fashion. We'll have them problem solve some things. 
and then what's good about all those tests is that we have large normative samples for them. So we can take their performance and compare it to other individuals in their age range, possibly their education, demographic background, which gives us a good idea, again, of that kind of age-related uh, age related change that we talked about earlier. Any stories of patients that really stand out at you over the years? Ones that, I don't know, either shocked you in a good or a bad way? So one, one thing that I think kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier is that I think the importance of, again, if individuals have concerns about their thinking skills, I really think it's important that they get a comprehensive workup. And one barrier to that is, again, the wait list, but I still think it's worth it. Reason being is I had a patient a couple weeks ago, uh, a gentleman in his early 70s, uh, a bright guy. He saw his primary care doctor because he and his wife have concerns about his memory. And also he's reporting some difficulty with finding the words that he wants to use, just kind of general forgetfulness. And he also has the family history of dementia. Both of his parents had dementia and died from it. And so the, the primary care doctor unfortunately told him that he had Alzheimer's disease and went ahead and started him on a medication for Alzheimer's disease. And then also ordered up a more comprehensive workup, uh, including my evaluation. But, you know, six months go by and the individual, that is kind of hard news for him to take. And he and his wife started planning accordingly. Well, what do I need to do now that I have this? So they share the news with their three children. They start deciding whether or not they want to sell their home so that they can move into a transitional facility that will have different levels of care as he progresses and gets worse. Um, they're kind of reevaluating their finances, things like that. Well, ultimately I see the individual and he actually excels on testing. He, he did excellent. Even when compared to individuals with his high level education, he was performing well above what was normal. So there was absolutely no sign that he had Alzheimer's disease, no evidence at all. Um, and just the forgetfulness that he was noticing was just related to some stress. Um, so I, I really want to advocate for uh, patients being persistent about getting comprehensive workups, uh, just because it's really important to help them understand what's going on with them. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense, right? Because you either could have Alzheimer's and don't know it, or you might <clears throat> be having other issues that masquerade as Alzheimer's, but they're not. Yeah. You don't want to throw your whole life into a blender, you know, and change everything. If you don't have that. Exactly. Okay. Well, very good. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything else I should have asked you, but what's the best way for people to find out more about your work and about uh, neuropsychologists like you? Where can they go? Yeah. So they can, if they search neuropsychology in particular, uh, the Society for Clinical Neuropsychology is a great resource. Also the uh, National Academy of Neuropsychology. Those are both great organizations within the U.S., and there's also the International Neuropsychological Society for any folks overseas anywhere. Uh, but all, all three of those are great organizations. Well, very good. Well, I appreciate you coming on the podcast and uh, talking about this. It's, you know, again, it's an issue I would bet that uh, probably I just bet everyone's afraid of. So the more they know about it, the better. So thank you. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.